My name is Allison Lights, and I'm a programmer here at Maisel's Documentary Center. Um, this panel is being co-presented, however, not just by us. Um, we have our wonderful co-presenters, New American Economy and Latin Reel as well. And we are so grateful to share this evening with every one of you who has joined us synchronously and to those of you who watch afterwards, thank you as well. Before our moderator, Leani Garcia Torres from New American Economy takes us into the next portion of the evening, I wanted to take a couple minutes to remind you all in the audience to be thinking of questions and to submit them throughout the panel in the Q&A box, which should be at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer all of the questions um, at, the, at the end, so after the moderated panel. If you enjoyed what you saw tonight, we hope that you will take the time to sign up for each of our mailing lists so you can hear about our upcoming programming. I know we all have many different things on our plates these days, but we hope that you um, also have had a chance to watch the film. And if you haven't yet, you can do so at um, mazels.org, or you can also um, find different screening partners as well on the My Name is Pedro site. Also, we have a special um, sidewalk screening tomorrow evening, so that's September 25th for those joining asynchronously. Um, it's a free sidewalk screening that will be on the Maisel's Sidewalk Cinema at, in Harlem at 7.30 p.m. There will be seats provided, but we do ask that you bring a mask and probably wear a jacket because it's gotten a little chillier these days. I also wanted to inform you all that we have a parallel fundraiser going on with this screening. All donations that we receive when you purchase a ticket for this film will be sent um, in their entirety to a wonderful organization in the Bronx called Dream Yard. Dream Yard's programs develop an artistic voice, nurture young people's desire to make change and cultivate the skills necessary to reach positive goals. Dream Yard believes that young people in the Bronx need a continuous set of support to help them toward positive outcomes as they navigate their educational pathways. In Dream Yard's 50 collaborating Bronx schools, K through 12th, K through 12th grade at the Dream Yard Prep High School, the Dream Yard Art Center, and in their work-based learning programs. They have every expectation that through offering sustained and meaningful support to their youth, will that offering that will help them develop the tools they need to become creative and engaged citizens, lifelong learners, and the leaders and innovators of the 21st century. Also, a fun fact is that the protagonist of the film, which was the impetus for tonight's panel, my name is Pedro. Pedro Santana actually has worked closely with this organization in his throughout his career. I wanted to thank everyone's tireless dedication to bring this panel together. Um, that goes out to Catherine Steinberg, Julie DeSarbo, and Sam Schwartz from New American Economy, Lillian LaSalle, who's on the panel, but also her team at Sweet 180, Emma Griffiths, Dora Dotson, Kyle Greenberg, and Ali Walsh, as well as the incred incredible Jesus Hernandez from Latin Reel. Each of you have worked tirelessly to make this offering a success and against all odds, especially in this virtual world and we at Maisel's are so grateful to have worked with each one of you on this project. So without further ado, um, before I pass the virtual baton on to Leani Garcia Torres, the Associate Director of State and Local Initiatives at New American Economy, who's gonna introduce the incredible lineup of panelists as well as moderate for tonight's event. Let's watch this short excerpt from the film. Give me just a second here. I'm gonna pull it up. He went to a high school one day to meet with the principal, Mrs. Fields. Is it the cafeteria? Can, can we walk inside? It's, right now, it's filled with students for lunch, but we can go. He said, okay, we're meeting in the cafeteria. And she's like, in the cafeteria? He said, our students need to see us discussing their future to know that we care about them. Who would think like that? They knew that he cared, and every kid would walk up to him and remember them by name. I'm asking what my answer is. Goodbye. Goodbye. It's over 75. Yeah? Be careful, okay? Those kids believed in him. They didn't fear him. They respected him. It was an attitude. Looking at each child as an individual and saying, 
If it's good for kids, we're there. Thank you so much for that, Allison. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Good evening, everyone. Once again, my name is Leanne Garcia Torres. I'm the Associate Director of State and Local Initiatives at New American Economy. We're a bipartisan research and advocacy organization making the economic case for sensible immigration policies. And tonight, I am beyond thrilled to be joined by this incredible panel to discuss the film, My Name is Pedro. Um, our first panelist is actually Lillian LaSalle. She's a native New Yorker, Peabody Award winner, president of Sweet 180, and the producer and director of My Name is Pedro. We're also joined by Asif Manvi, a brilliant actor, comedian, writer, and producer. He's featured in this film. We're joined by Dr. Deborah Ma um, Mashek, executive advisor to the Heterodox Academy, which is a nonpartisan nonprofit group of academics that promotes viewpoint diversity. And finally, we're joined by Eric Santana, who is Pedro Santana's brother. So welcome all. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us tonight. Um, I personally love that clip, Lillian. When I watch it, I think it's such a great first introduction to Pedro and the ideals that drove his work um, within the school system. And I'd love to start off learning a bit more about how you came to know about Pedro and see if you could tell us a little bit more about how the project developed and more about your journey in turning his story into a film. Uh, sure. So I came to know about Pedro by reading an article in the New York Times. Uh, there was an article about him on the cover of the Metropolitan section of the Times. And the article was about how he had changed a failing middle school around in the South Bronx, MS391. It was also about how he had, uh, in part of changing the, the school around, had uh, implemented this, uh, this technique that he really believed in, which is that people's environments really affect them. So for kids, especially the environment in which they're learning is, is in um, affects the way they learn. So he went into MS391 as a new principal and changed all the furniture, uh, took all of his furniture out of the principal's office. He refused to have a desk. Uh, he put sofas in, he put television sets and sofas and seating areas in the school hallways so that people could get together, collaborate and talk. But he wanted the principal's office to be uh, very welcoming in a place where everyone felt like they could just walk into, knock on his door anytime and talk to him rather than do a formal meet and greet by setting an appointment and going to see the principal. So in essence, he was one of them. He was, you know, he wasn't, uh, you know, there wasn't an impression that he was above them, uh, that he was this authority figure, but actually he was part of the student body. And that was one of the ways in which he, he really um, affected them. And then in terms of the journey of making the film, I actually did not intend on directing a feature film or a documentary. Um, I have produced some feature films and reading his story uh, and the, the content within the story um, really captivated me. But the thing that, that really got me and you know, put me in a place where I couldn't stop thinking about him and brought me to the, the decision of contacting him was the photo that was featured in the article, which is Pedro with this long flowing hair, you know, in what looks like a nightclub dancing with his students. And I looked at that picture and I thought, that doesn't look like any principal I've ever had growing up as I have, uh, born and raised in Brooklyn, growing up in the public school system. And it just left this impression on me. Um, and so getting back to the journey of the film, I went to meet with him with this idea that I would produce a film and I would hire a director that would tell his story. Um, so I wanted to get to know him and talk to him about the possibility of doing this. But within the first five or 10 minutes of being in the same room with him, I thought, 
well, forget about my plan. This guy, he's a documentary. People need to meet him. And the way I felt um, in his presence in those first five or 10 minutes was that I was the best version of myself. And I don't know how he did that, but that was truly how I felt. And I thought, this is how his teachers feel. This is how his students feel. Well, no wonder why there's so much success happening in this building. So that was the start of a five year filming journey um, in, which I, in which I followed him uh, throughout, you know, throughout his days uh, at work, at home. Um, and so we spent five years shooting him, two years in edit. Um, and so it was seven years all together. And in making the film, he really, he really changed my life and the person I am today. Yeah, it's evident that everyone he came in contact with couldn't help but leave almost a changed person. And Eric, as his brother, you had a front row seat to, to all of these adventures. Um, and you've seen your brother overcome so much from learning delays and a stutter as a child to contentious school board politics as an administrator. What do you think it is that ultimately gave him that drive to continuously and seemingly joyously overcome adversity and to continue in his mission even when he was pushed out of the system that he cared so much about? Yeah, so I think it's uh, I think it's twofold. One is um, Pedro's really desire for um, everyone to have an education. I mean, my my parents stress education growing up. We grew up in the '70s and '80s in the Bronx, where there was not really a lot of opportunity for us. And my parents had the great foresight to make sure that we get we have an education. That's one thing that can never be taken away from us. So that was one thing that my parents always instilled in us. And so Pedro, Pedro feels that that's what his students and people around him need to really have that same kind of value for education. I mean, my siblings, I have uh, five, five siblings. My, one of my oldest sisters, she is later in life, got three masters, and now she's going for a doctorate in child psychology. This is the, this is the, the um, the, the influence of my parents and of Pedro in particular to make sure that we strive for education, educational excellence throughout our career. And that's, that's for his siblings, that's for our nieces and nephews, and that's for everyone that he touches. I mean, he can have a conversation with anyone, be it at a Costco or what have you, and the conversation automatically turns into, what are you doing? What are you doing for school? You know, so it's that kind of impact that he has on people just on a regular basis. And that's really what's one of his, his goals in life is to be to have impact and to be impacted. And Lillian, you've had such a unique opportunity to see him impact people over this five, seven year journey. Um, but through that, you also saw some some challenges that came up. How unexpected were those and how did you handle that aspect of it while making this film? Um, well, if you're speaking to, let's say, the red tape slash political challenges that he faced in the public school system, I can tell you that I, for a long time, railed against putting any kind of uh, politics into this film. So at the outset, I said, I don't want to make a film about the success or failings of the public school system. Another documentary was already made about that. It's called Waiting for Superman, and I'm never going to make a film as good as that one. <laughs> I said, I really just want to learn more about Pedro and follow him in his life. Um, and then realize, well, if I'm following him in his life, then I'm following him through his challenges. And those challenges, you know, that are highlighted in the film happen to be with the school board, with the Department of Education. And that um, was where I ended up with cameras. Um, and the way the community surrounded him in support and rallied for him, I think, is one of the highlights of the film for me, because you don't often see parents and community members, students, all coming together in a room, in a boardroom, 
um, in droves to talk about an administrator and how much that person means to them um, and how much their lives will change if he leaves and begging the school board to let him stay. Um, and that was really, I've never seen anything like that truly in my life. Um, so the, so the film does have some of those politics. And the other thing I'm going to say is that seeing him rise above those challenges. So when he was a child and had learning disabilities, he rose above that with the help of a mentor, a third grade teacher, Yvonne Torres, who took him under her wing and said, learning disabilities, so what? I'm going to help you. I'm going to pay attention to your needs. We're gonna get through these challenges. And I believe that affected him greatly. And I believe that that's why he became a teacher and a mentor to so many people because this one teacher reached out to him to change his life. And then in turn, he decided he was gonna change many other people's lives. Facing up to the challenge of the school politics was a similar thing. He didn't take, he was always an optimist. He never took anything personally. When I asked him if he was angry about what was happening, he said, oh, you know, anger, it's a use, useless emotion. It just didn't fit. And so he, he faced challenges head on and was on to the next thing. Well, it seems like no matter the unexpected challenges, Pedro always finds a way to fight for the children, whether it's in the Bronx or Rockland County or around the world, as we'll see later. Um, and it struck me that one of the most important things that the film highlighted is exactly what you just said, Lillian, that a passionate and caring educator can have such a tremendous impact on, on many lives and in many different ways. Um, Asif, you are a talented actor, writer, you're a hilarious comedian, but that doesn't always translate into an education advocate. So could you tell us a little bit more about how you became involved in the project and maybe a little bit Bit about your own personal experiences that allow you to relate to the work or impact of someone like Pedro? Well, um, for those of you who don't know, um, I, I got involved with this project because, because Lillian is actually my manager. And she told me about this film that she was, this documentary that she was making. And, and I actually didn't know that much about it. I, I, she asked me if I had any, uh, if I wanted to talk about, you know, a teacher that had impacted me uh, uh, because she was doing these interviews for her documentary. And so I got involved in that way. And then it was like <clears throat> many, many months later that I actually got to see the film and, um, and got to meet, I guess, at least in the film, you know, Pedro himself and got to see what a remarkable person he was and um, why Lillian had followed him through this story of his life and his challenges and, and what he went through. And so it was a really, uh, I, I didn't, I, I went into it sort of not knowing what it was and then kind of discovered it with everyone else uh, other than it was about a teacher and it was the story of, of, of this, of this, of this person. Um, and so it was, uh, it was pretty remarkable to see, like what Lillian already said was how he handled challenges and the way he transformed uh, the school that he was in and the relationship he had with his students and, and just the relationship he had to his, his own struggles uh, health wise and otherwise, you know, which was uh, really inspiring and, and, and touching and moving. And so um, it was, it was just a, 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 it's just, if you haven't seen the film yet, it's, it, it's really well worth seeing, so. Thank you. Um, Deb, I wanted to turn to you because one of the lines that stuck out to me most in the film was when Pedro was defining impact and he defined it as helping people think differently. He seemed so passionate about thinking outside the box to find solutions that work best for the kids instead of getting caught up in procedures and what education should look like and your work to support the importance of uh, diversity in, in viewpoint in education seems to fit so perfectly with the film. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about that work and how we can develop more out-of-the-box thinkers in education like Pedro. 
So one of the things that strikes me about Pedro's ap approach that I think we can all learn from there is how uncomfortable it can be to go into the unfamiliar. It can be scary. It feels risky. And then you think about when I watched the film and I was thinking about what is he doing that's enabling him to do that with such grace and enthusiasm. And Lily and I loved what you were saying about that notion that you could see people around him lifting up and, and being the best version of themselves. And I think what it comes down to is relationships, that notion that, and I forget who, who mentioned it already too, that he was not better than anybody else. He was there being present with them. And what that signals for me, and I think is very relevant to this idea of viewpoint diversity, is that we are all situated knowers, that all of us have a vantage point. We're seeing the complexities of the world by virtue of being human. We can only really see one aspect of that. And that notion that if I really care about the kids, if I really care about solving the problems that are facing the world, there is nothing more profound and real than getting the opportunity to learn alongside or to think alongside somebody else who has a different vantage point that we, the only way we can understand the complexities and the nuance is to learn together, to be together, to be in relationship and to have the, the courage to trust by asking, how do you see it? What's your story? Where are you coming from? And what for me really um, oozed out <laughs> through, through this film is that he seems to do, he seemed to do that instantly. And I love Eric, your point about he was doing it with people at Costco, he was doing it with his students and his staff. And just that's an incredible energy to be around and to make it safe to take the risk of being seen, of being known, and also of actually getting to know somebody else as well. Yeah. And it seems like this out of the box thinking is something we're going to need in spades as we face I, this word is probably the most overused word of 2020, but the unprecedented changes we've seen this year and the current um, pandemic has presented a lot of challenges for many students, but especially some of the students that uh, Pedro fought for the most, you know, Hispanic students, black students, immigrants, low income families. Um, they're lacking access to things like broadband internet, which you need during remote learning. Our, our research found that more than one in five households with school aged children don't have broadband access and that's 1.6 million immigrant families. That's something you need vitally at this time. Um, but it also seems like the barriers that were, well, the barriers that are only only exacerbated, it's also an opportunity if, if we decide to look at it that way to do some some of our own out of the box thinking. So Deb, you're not off the hook yet. Um, I was chatting with you and Lillian earlier about how the pandemic has provided us a really rare opportunity to let folks tell their own story and have it be heard in unique ways. We wouldn't have been streaming into, into all these houses tonight if it weren't for the challenges that we're facing. And so I was wondering if you could tell me how you think this power of storytelling and curiosity and out of the box thinking can help us foster long term change that will be here long after we recover from the pandemic. Yeah, I think for me, what when you ask that question, what's on my mind is the the way labels limit us. And so, you know, I'm thinking about the scene um, where Pedro is talking about the ascetic Jews at the uh, on the school board council and how he's very curious about their their lives and enthusiastic about developing those relationships. Or when he's talking about, you know, here I was a student with special needs, and it it wasn't a limiting factor. But but for some, the labels define you. It's like, oh, I'm reading you as this, and therefore I seem to know all about you. But really. The labels are the starting point for the conversation, the starting point to ask people, so tell me about you. I want to understand, I want to understand your story and your complexity. And I think um, with COVID, it's been this great disruptor. It, it makes us realize like we really don't know too much about anything. And uh, we're all experiencing this differently. And I don't know what's happening over at my neighbors necessarily until I ask. And just asking, just honoring the fact that you don't have all of the answers. There's no way you possibly can. That takes humility. Um, it takes curiosity. And once we allow ourselves to start engaging with other people like that, I think it opens up possibilities. We start to see there are things we haven't thought about before that we could be doing in education. There are things we could be doing differently in the ways our families are relating to other families. And all of that it opens up possibilities, that opens up um, new ideas, new directions, 
and my cat is now trying to eat the, the keyboard. So she appears, I apologize. Um, and yeah, so, so just it, it opens up the way we're thinking. We start connecting new dots, new people, new ideas, new possibilities, and that it's through that relationship that we can start activating on some of those. Well, as we, um, as we saw over and over in the film, Pedro was a, a master at modifying on the fly, um, at adapting and changing the curriculum. And Lillian, as you mentioned, even the physical environment to benefit the kids. Um, and it seems to me not having met him, but feeling like I know him from having watched the film that um, his biggest goal is to just make sure that kids know that they matter as individuals um, and that they have someone to believe in them and push them. And I think especially in light of the COVID crisis, something that keeps coming to mind is how do we empower educators and administrators to think more like Pedro to change the culture of our schools so that we're thinking holistically about the kids, their home lives, are they having to translate for their, for their parents when they get home from school, their individual circumstances. And um, I think about, you know, Eric, you were mentioning education in your family, my father, Joel, and my yeah. sister in my head, that we were gonna get a master's degree before we did anything else. It was, it was right. a given I've seen firsthand, you know, my husband's mother had three boys in Brooklyn in the New York City education system and she, basically made sure they knew failure was not an option um, and gave them that support that they needed to, to survive what some might see as insurmountable barriers. So I guess a question for, for all of you, I'd love to hear all of you, what do you think it is that we can do to make this mentality scalable for, for those kids that might not have that person at home or might not have necessarily that, that teacher like Pedro had, how can we make this mentality scalable so that every child knows that they matter as an individual and is being cared for holistically in the education system? Well, um, I guess I wanted to mention something first that may not directly go to your question. So perhaps I can hand it off to someone else to, to answer that fully. Um, I, I wanted to mention something that you had brought up before, um, which had to do with the pandemic and the situation that we're in now, um, you know, how our kids are learning differently. Um, and you talked about people telling their stories. So despite the atrocities that we've been, you know, facing during this pandemic, it's also brought us a lot of really positive opportunities. So one of those things is we get to meet people face to face more than ever. And so if there's going to be a program in which we can make Pedro's message scalable, now would be the best time to do it because we could reach so many more people on Zoom, virtually, online, than we could before, because this is how people are mostly engaging now. Um, in regard to the film, uh, the film was set to release in theaters on May 29th, but that was going to be a very small opening. It's because openings moved to virtual that now my film is in theaters nationwide. I mean, it's in 25 or 30 theaters it is opening up in, and that is, that is a huge opportunity um, for the film, for be, being able to tell the story of this film. Like, I can't believe how much coverage the film has gotten, how many television interviews, how many interviews I've done, how many people like you are so interested in supporting it. I don't think that would have happened pre-COVID. And the last thing I wanna say about that is about teachers and remote learning for a lot of parents. You know, I'm a parent of an 11 and 13 year old and who are also remote learning. And a lot of parents are having a, a very hard time with this. Um, they are figuring out how to work while balancing the remote learning at home. Um, there are a lot of complaints about remote learning. What are our kids missing? Is it the same quality of education? How is it going to affect them later? Oh, isn't it so horrible that they missed their graduation ceremony? Well, what I wanna say and what Pedro would say if he was on this panel 
is that it's time for us actually to lift up these teachers. These teachers are having to teach in a different way than they ever have been able to before. They're watching their students on a screen in a little square, <laughs> little square, and I bet that now more than ever, they're able to really tune in to each child. And now there's also a crossover between home and school, because as a parent, I can actually walk into my kid's room and hear what the teacher is saying. I can hear how my child is interacting in that virtual classroom. That's something we've never been able to do before. But I think it's really so important to think of, the, of our teachers now as what I've been saying are, are sort of like our frontline workers, if you will, who are, who are doing the best that they can. And, and sort of learning how to lift up the situation we're in now in regard to kids' education. It's going to be different. It's not going to be the same. It may not be the best quality, but I believe that post-COVID, that there will be certain arrangements made for that. Perhaps they will change some policies around SATs, um, around, uh, you know, um, uh, the, uh, you know, the necessary sort of the necessary uh, paperwork, essays, testing that's needed to get into certain colleges. I believe that post COVID, all those things will be adjusted. And what I think that will do for diversity is to open up more opportunities for, for kids to get into you know, uh, have, have a larger selection of schools where grades are looked at in a different way um, and are not as important as much as the, the, the child, I say a child, even high school is not a child, but you know what I mean, in a more personal way, in a way that tries to find out who this person is going to be in the world, what they're going to bring um, to the school, how are they going to collaborate more than what they've gotten on their SAT? So I, I, I'm sure I didn't answer your question, but that was something, something that I wanted to, to bring up and cover. I'd like to bounce off of that and also connect it, Leone, back to your question too, which is, there's this phrase that keeps going through my head, which is that we can't do things differently by doing them the same. Um, and that so much I think of this distance learning has been about how can we recreate what it's like to be in person. There, there are some problems with the, the in-person phenomena. And like you were saying, Lillian, the access and um, what, you know, the, the students and how many students in a class and can the teacher really focus on them. And so this opportunity to say, we, we can try this in a lot of different ways. And I think what's needed is we have to give permission to experiment and we have to give permission to fail. And yeah, I'm a parent too. I've got a 10 year old in the other room playing with the puppy. And what I always think about is what gets rewarded gets repeated. And if you're asking your students to play it safe, your teachers to play it safe, your staff, your administrators, even us as citizens and are expecting our school board members to just play it, you know, do what's always been done, we're not going to see disruption. We're not going to see a lot of innovation. And so thinking through how do we reward those people who are taking some risk and who are trying things differently. And it's everything from, you know, the kid who decides not to, fo not to follow the directions on the art project and comes up with something, but it doesn't look like the snowman that we were supposed to be making. That's okay. And like, how do we reward that? And sometimes it's with a smile. Sometimes it's with the high five. Sometimes it's with a, wow, could you tell another, this other classroom about that? Or can you share that idea with another um, school board member? Or can we take that innovation and figure out a way to pollinate it across perspectives like that's incredibly rewarding and it says to all of us it's okay to experiment and if you fall flat that's okay too yeah i i think that is um i think as pedro's philosophy overall is the notion of thinking outside of the box looking at things in many different ways so that there's just not one way to solve a problem and to deborah's point is really how do we reward that and make sure that kids are allowed to fail or allowed to do things that are different than what 
the teacher is instructing or what you know the instruction of the piece of paper is saying. It's really having that that flexibility flexibility to do that. Another thing I think is really about having um, displaying a lot more empathy for our educators because they are learning as much as we are as parents and as students are in this virtual world. So I think the notion of, of, of empathy needs to really be talked about more freely and that we really have to um, think about what is that teacher going through? What is that one child going through? It's different than this other child. So we need to think about the, the, the emotional aspect of learning in a different way during these like virtual times also, which is again, you know, Pedro really looks at each student individually. There's no two students that learn the same. There's no two students that react to something the same way. So it's really about how can we do that in this virtual environment and moving forward too, because that should be whatever the new norm is. Also, uh, Lanny, you brought up something uh, when you were talking earlier that struck me, which, and I've read a lot about this, and I don't have the answers to this because this is not really my world, but um, you know, students who don't have access to the kind of technology that is required for them to participate in this new way of learning. You know, there are a lot of immigrant kids socioeconomically, uh, you know, uh, are on the lower end of the socioeconomic ladder. Um, how do they participate in that? You know, I think is a big question of like, if you only have one computer at home and everybody's using that computer or you don't have a computer at all, you know, you don't have, uh, that's, a, that's a big, uh, question, I think, in this um, new world of, of, of learning in this way. I don't have an answer to that. I leave it to people who are more qualified. Even just asking, being brave enough to ask the questions. And yeah, I mean, I've, just, and I've also read a lot about this, you know, that this is, this is a problem in this, in this sort of virtual world where parents are, and there are, there are students who are being left out uh, of that conversation because of not having access, you know? I think that's an important thing to be aware of. Absolutely. I have one more question before I'll stop monopolizing our panelists. Um, I wanna encourage everyone, if you have a question you would like to ask, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and you can feel free to put those in there. We'll read them out. If not, I have a list I can keep on asking. Um, but Asif, I actually wanted to, to end with you. You know, you talked a bit about how you became involved in the project and William really asked you to think about the educators that it had impacted you. So I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more to end us on, a, on an uplifting note about the Pedros in your life and what impact, what lasting impact you feel they've had on your life. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I think, you know, I think we should all go around and talk about like the Pedros in our life. Um, you know, for me, uh, I will say that the, one of the, one of the teachers that I had most importantly, uh, in my life, uh, recently actually passed away, uh, from COVID, uh, and his name was Wynn Handman and he was, uh, my acting teacher for two decades. Uh, and, uh, you know, what was so wonderful about Wynn was that, uh, he, he took, he took his students um, where they were. In other words, the, the level of talent that they brought, the level of uh, 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 training that they had or whatever. And he never, um, it, was, it was a place where you could experiment, you could fail, you could try. And there was, you know, as, as an actor, uh, you take a lot of acting classes and you study acting in school and high school and college, you know, and often you'll have teachers who will shame you or make you feel bad or make you feel not talented. Or, and when really had the capacity to what, what, what uh, Lillian was talking about with Pedro earlier, which is like, bring the best out of you and find the aspect of you that was your internal goal and find that and uh, figure out a way to, to, to let that shine. Uh, another teacher that I had, going way back when I was in boarding school in England, um, and, and it still stays with me because I went to a very, and this was back in the 70s when um, education was about a teacher coming in and just sort of telling you the history, you know, what World War I was about, and then you just wrote a bunch of notes down, and then there was an exam at the end of the semester, and we had this one teacher who, uh, he, he would never, he, would, we, he, he wouldn't just come in and lecture to us. He would sit down at the edge of the table and, and he wouldn't even sit behind his desk, which was very unusual for that 
private British boarding school. He would sit at the end of, end of his table, and I remember he would just tell us stories about his life. And I remember he told us a story about the Cuban Missile Crisis and how he, um, what he was doing on that day uh, when, when uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev were in this stalemate and, they, and the world thought that there was going to be a nuclear war. And he remembers he was in Barbados. And I still remember to this day the story, he was in Barbados looking at what he thought may have been maybe the last sunset that he would ever see because there was going to be. And that story has stuck with me to this day because of the way he told it to us. And I, I learned about the Cuban Missile Crisis and that moment in history that historic, through him and because of the way he told me that story and, and engaged with us as human beings and as just, uh, you know, as, as, as other people on this journey through life, just like he was. Uh, and so I found that really powerful. Um, so now you go, Lanny, and you tell us who is your Pedro? <laughs> That's a difficult one. Um, I think my Pedro was probably Mr. Sandoval, who was my U.S. history teacher in um, 11th grade. I loved history, was always a history nerd, um, but as can sometimes happen, I got senioritis a little bit early the second semester of my junior year, and he just had a way, it was a hard class, it was an honors class, um, and he had a way of encouraging you in fun, and so he was like, you said you wanted to be my teaching assistant next year. My teaching assistants can't be getting bad grades. What's going on? And really wanted to know, what is it that's making your grade slip? I know you're a good student, and pushing me and reminding me, um, reminding me to just keep at it, essentially. And just having those teacher, I mean, all these years later, it sticks with me that my teacher cared that my grade, it wasn't low, it was a B minus, but he, he knew that that wasn't what I normally got. He knew something was going on in my life and he stopped and talked to me out of all his students to make sure that I could keep, um, keep achieving what he knew were my goals. So um, Deb, I might, I might kick it to you. Who's your Pedro? I will say Darlene Wheeler. She was my ninth grade science teacher. And what I loved about her is when we would ask her questions, she was willing to say, I don't know. And she would say, how can we figure that out? And then next thing you know, she'd be, you know, we'd be like putting together experiments or crawling on the floor, looking at the details of something that was happening down there and just willing to be with us in the complexities. And her her joy at unpacking that with us. And she would, I mean, she was just delighted in the questions and in being present with us. And I, um, you know, I taught for 14 years at the college level also. And I, on those really hard days where I was like, what am I doing here? This is, this is eating me up right now. I would uh, try to channel her and, and try to go into that space of curiosity and openness. Eric, what about you? I'd love to hear a little more about it. Yeah, sure. So, um, so Pedro and I were very fortunate that we went to this small annex school in the Bronx. And it was, um, I don't know, maybe 120 kids. And so my Pedro is a colleague of Pedro's Pedro, Yvonne Torres, and her name is Inez Cruz. She was my second and third grade teacher. And one of the things I, and one of the things I remember about her is she brought in the arts into my classroom. So she taught us about music and dance. And every year we would put on a performance for our parents. And it was about, it was songs about Puerto Rico. It was songs about Dominican Republic. It was really about our culture. And that's, that really stuck with, with Pedro and I really throughout our entire, our entire lives. Um, and I, I know Cruz is still in my life where maybe two years ago she came to California I introduced her to my kids, to my wife. So it's one of these things that someone that really kind of impacts your life and stays, I mean, she actually stayed in our lives. And it's just an amazing thing because it's one of, it was a very easy answer when you asked the question, who's my Pedro? Because it was very, you know, quick to mind where is uh, Mrs. Cruz. Lillian, I'd love to hear who your Pedro is. Uh, so easy. I mean, the first time I was asked that question, it came right out. It's Claire Levine, Miss Claire Levine. If you're out there and listening, I love you. Uh, she was my seventh grade teacher, Brooklyn Public School. And what she did was, I guess I've always been like an extroverted introvert. <laughs> 
and have no, I've never sort of like taken my work and said, hey, look at this. And she found a way to sort of uh, focus on what I was doing and highlight it in the classroom. An example is that, you know, I would write poetry, but no one really knew about it, but somehow she did. So she either saw it on, you know, I don't know what happened. And she said, you should enter the poetry contest. And um, I thought that was absolutely ridiculous. Um, but she forced me to do it. She said, you have to do, you have to do it. And I actually won the school-wide uh, poetry contest. <laughs> um, she also was the one that got the brochure for the High School of Performing Arts and said, here's the school you're going to audition for because I was in a school play in, uh, in, you know, in seventh grade. Um, again, never thought of myself as an actor, never, you know, just like I didn't think of myself as a poet. And, and I went and 4,000 kids auditioned that year and 60 were accepted. And I, I ended up going to the High School of Performing Arts, which was an amazing experience uh, to just be around um, so many great artists. And now the field that I'm in, which I represent actors, it's like the perfect, you know, I don't think if I, if I hadn't gone to the High School of Performing Arts and been around and really understood the plight of an actor, I don't think that I'd be able to do the job that I do now in the way that I do it. So she really, not to overuse this word, but she had a great impact on me. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I want to open it. I want to honor my word and open it up. Um, once again, we have a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Our first question is actually for Lillian. Um, it says, seven years to follow and produce um, a person for a documentary seems like a long time with a lot of moments to capture. How did your theme or storyline shift or change over the years? Um, so that's a great question. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. So I started following Pedro. I had never used a camera before. <laughs> I literally had to ask my producer how to turn it on and shoot. And um, uh, I didn't know what the story was going to be. I honestly didn't know. I just knew that I had to capture as much footage as possible and then decide later what the story was going to be. Um, and one thing that, that I did learn, which was a huge lesson because I don't, I still don't see myself as a director, even though I made this film. Um, but one thing I did that I'm proud of is that I followed my gut and my instinct in that I never scripted out the questions I was going to ask Pedro. So they were all on the fly, in the moment. And even though my colleagues around me, much more experienced producers and cameramen and, you know, and all that stuff would say, you know, you may want to script it. And I'd always say, no, like I trust what my questions will be in the moment. And so Pedro led the story. I talked to a guy at HBO for some guidance while I was shooting who worked in documentaries. And I said, how will I know when I'm going to be done shooting? And he said, you don't know till you know. Um, and then the shape of the story came through in the edit. Um, I had no idea what the beginning, middle and end was going to be. It was many, many weeks working with an editor, uh, doing, you know, one cut after another cut, testing cuts in front of an audience. Um, and then if you have seen the film, you'll know what I'm talking about. The way that the film is bookended now, you know, the beginning and the end, and, uh, and that part of it, that idea came to me in the middle of the night when we couldn't figure out how to start and end. It came, came to me in the middle of the night, literally. And I like sort of woke up and I was like, oh my God, that's, that's, that's the movie. And um, it's really a natural process. That's why you also can't, in this, in a document, documentary telling environment, decide how long you're gonna spend 
in the edit. You do if you're working for HBO and they only budget you for 16 weeks or 30 weeks and then you've got to do, but if you're doing something on your own and you're calling the, your own shots, then you can spend two years in post-production and really make, I really wanted the story to work. That's great, thank you. Um, Eric, this next question is actually for you. Uh, have you been able to view this film from a point of view that isn't as Pedro's brother? And if so, how does that differ from how you feel about him as your brother? Yeah, it's a great question. So I've seen the film, I don't know, in different versions, probably 10 to 12 times. And each time I see the film, um, I, I can separate myself a little bit further each time I watch it. And, um, and today, when I saw the film, I saw the film really about, wow, that person, who's my brother, has, has um, a lot, he made, a, he made impact in people's lives in a way that um, I left today saying, what am I doing? What kind of impact can I make in people's lives? And for me, it's really more about a smaller scale. Pedro does it in a much larger scale. But for me, I, I said to myself, what can I do today, tomorrow, especially during these times where our voices need to be heard, we need to act. So today I left saying, Pedro acts on a, on a, on a daily basis for the people that he impacts, and I have to do the same thing too. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what, that's what makes it different for me as I watch it. It's really now, I'm not looking at him as my brother, I'm looking at, at this person as an activist, as a voice, as someone who demands change on a consistent basis from the people around him. I think it's so important to, you know, on the smaller scale, it's a ripple effect. I doubt any of our Pedros thought that years later we would be sitting here talking about the impact they've had on our life and how that's maybe changed the course of our life or how we seek to impact others. And so the small, the small impacts are the big impacts, right? Um, all right, let's sure. do one more question. I'll, I'll leave it open. Think of your last questions and I'll answer a couple more if they come in. I wanna respect everyone's time. Lillian, this one's for you again. What scene did you find the most powerful watching or filming? Can we come back to me? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Because, oh, okay. I, oh. Well, I can't get, for people who haven't seen it, I don't want to give too much away because we all know that the film has many unexpected twists and turns. And that's, I think, one of the, one of the things that really resonates with people. So I don't want to give too much away. But since this person has seen the film, I will say that the most powerful moment for me um, or has become the most powerful moment for me because I've watched the film with others in, during our film festival tour. Um, in the scene where you're seeing uh, the audience members and um, watching a version of Pedro's film on a screen in front of them in a theater where uh, something is revealed, which I won't say what it is. Um, the gasps from the audience members I'm sitting with, like the utter surprise and gasps have, has made that, and then the tears, has made that the most powerful scene in the movie for me, you know, after the fact. I think um, I'm going to take my moderator privilege and, and say it might actually be really nice for us to close on on all of us answering that question. What do you, what has, without ruining the ending, what was the most impactful scene? I know for me, it's probably a random one, but it was in that clip um, where he said, we're going to have the meeting in the cafeteria. And they said, in the cafeteria, why? And he said, if they don't see us discussing their future, how will they know? How will they know that we care about their future? And just 
you know, I, I haven't worked with children professionally. I've, I've been able to in extracurricular um, activities, but it's true when children know you care and that you're coming out of it from caring and not from fear, the, the freedom it gives them to want to do better, to know that they have someone to, um, my husband always says someone to disappoint, but not in a bad way. And someone believes in you so much and you want to live up to your potential for that reason. And so I think that was very impactful for me. Um, Asif, what would you say was the most for you? Um, you know, I saw the movie uh, more than a year ago. So um, I'm, I'm, I agree with Lillian's uh, thing that she was talking about. I don't want to give anything away, but also, what was most impactful for me was the sort of um, the cumulative emotional experience that I had while watching the movie. It was more about like, rather than just one scene, I felt like um, I entered this movie not knowing who this man was at all and, and, and why he was worthy of making a documentary about. And then by the end of it, I was incredibly emotionally affected by his story and his journey and, and what uh, ultimately um, he struggled with. So uh, I think I'm going to say that it was more of a cumulative effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Deb, what about you? So first I have to disclose that I watched the film in two parts because Mama Duty interrupted. So I'd sat down to start. And then when I came back to it, um, I started watching at the beginning again, and then I make it through the end. And what I remember when I first encountered the opening scene, I'm like, who is this guy? Well, first of all, I can share that he's kissing everybody as they walk into this theater. And there's this, I don't know, COVID lens still on. We're like, I don't know, can we do that anymore? But I'm like, who's this guy who warrants an opening in a theater? And there are all these people coming in. He knows every single one of them. What is his story? And then to watch those same people later, so a different scene than what Lillian was talking about, um, there for him in this amazing community embrace and looking out at this audience who's there to see him and seeing their diversity and age and race and like all the ways that you can imagine and realizing now I understand who, who he is and who they are and what they meant to each other. And it was, I mean, I'm getting teary just thinking about it. It was incredibly powerful. So Lillian, the idea of book ending, it works so well. <laughs> Thank you. Eric, what about for you? What, what was the most impactful? So uh, many scenes for me, but the one today is, uh, there's a scene where Pedro is um, in Haiti teaching um, a group of very young kids um, English. And the joy in Pedro's face as he hears, as, as he hears each of the child try to repeat, my name is, insert the, per, the kid's name, and each time the kid is like, my name is Pedro. And the joy that Pedro had having this interaction with these kids, it epitomizes his, um, his love for education, his love for learning, his love for teaching. And I think that to me kind of sums up Pedro in a nutshell. He really was about that individual interaction with the student and his joy of seeing a student learn and come up with the right answer. That to me was, is the most impactful. Again, today, we have discussion tomorrow, I'm gonna give you a different answer. Sign of a good film, right? Well, I want to I want to thank all of you for participating. This has been such a fun conversation for me to get to have about a film that I I just fell in love with as I watched. I want to abuse my moderator privilege one more time and just encourage all of us, all of us watching today to be that Pedro for someone. Um, as Eric was saying, just making committing to making that small change. We have no clue what impact that's going to have, especially especially in the year we're living in. Um, before I let you all go, I just wanna say thank you one more time, Lillian, for, for making this all possible by following the story. I wanna thank Latin Reel and the Maisel Center for making tonight possible at all. We wouldn't be here without both of you. 
Um, and last but not least, I want to thank everyone that has tuned in and watched the film. As a reminder, all donations through the screening purchase were sent directly to the Dream Yard. This is an organization that Pedro worked with um, firsthand when he was at the Bronx, and their programs really support and help um, young people find their artistic voice and nurture their desire to make a change. And if there's anything we've seen through this film and this discussion tonight is that that's necessary and it's more important than ever. Um, so thank you. Thank you for supporting independent film tonight and thank you for supporting an incredible cause. And we look forward to seeing you all again, hopefully soon. Thank you so much, Liani. And thank, thank you. you for everyone here on the panel for taking the time. Pray.